great British explorer, George Mallory, was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it. He said because it is there. So, in three months, I am going to be graduating college with a degree in environmental engineering, I hope. Um, time and time again, I get asked, what does that mean? What is environmental engineering? What do environmental engineers do? Well, we all know, engineers, they apply the principles of math and science to develop solutions to technical problems. But that sounds boring and nerdy. And if there's one thing I've learned, it's that my field does not have to be boring and nerdy. This is Gambella, Kenya. Now, if you search Gambella, Kenya in Google Maps, nothing will come up. That's how remote this village is. But a thousand people live here in Gambella. It's just that they have no cars, no TVs, no electricity, no running water, no toilets. Gambella is, by all definitions, off the grid. I went to Gambella last May with a group of students um, through Engineers Without Borders, and we were there to restore a wind-powered irrigation well um, that had fallen into disrepair a few years ago, leaving this village with only one viable water source. So we're there the, on the first day, and we're surveying the village, and we're meeting with the tribal leaders, and we're taking water samples, and we go check out this one supposedly working well. And this is what we find. So underneath this puddle, you see, is a small valve practically buried in the mud um, with a rusty little spout that you have to reach into the puddle blindly, find, and turn open. And once the water starts to flow, they have this long pipe, maybe 10 feet, which they stick into the puddle, shift around until it just barely fits onto the end of the spout, at which point they can tilt it up a couple degrees, put their buckets underneath, and water will flow out into it. Of course, then when they're done filling it, they have to remove the pipe, stick their hands back in there, reach around, find this valve, and turn it off. And they do this every single day, multiple times a day. Every time they need water to drink, to cook, to bathe with, to water their acres of crops, this is how they have to do it. And I couldn't stop thinking about how completely dysfunctional this is and how amazing and life-changing it could be for the hundreds of people using this well to collect their most basic human need to have a raised spout off the ground where they can walk up to and just turn a faucet like you and I. So the engineer in me kicks in and I take a few measurements, I draw a few sketches, I visit the hardware store in town the next day, and I have my solution. I just need some PVC, a couple pipe fittings, and 60 US dollars. So I go back to the village, and we propose the solution to the tribal elders, and explain that in accordance with my student group's policies, we will cover half the cost, and they have to front the second half. So $30 from us, $30 from them, no problem except they said no. And I'm thinking, what do you mean no? Hundreds of people use this well every single day. Surely between the time spent, the water wasted, and the priority of this need, $30, $30, it's a couple Starbucks, $30 is a worthy investment. But to the villagers of Gambella, it truly wasn't worth it. $30 is a lot of money. And the well still works, right? The water still flows. Might be unconventional, but that's how they do it. So this really changed the way that I think about engineering. I was working on another project at the time in New Delhi. I got gotten connected with some fellow USC students who had designed this waterless toilet in an effort to end open defecation. And they had this plan to go to India that summer and bring this waterless toilet, but they hadn't quite figured out yet what to do with the poop. So, you know, a toilet, it's not gonna do you much good if there's no way to safely transport and manage this waste. And I'm thinking, these guys are so naive, they have, they're so in over their heads, they have no idea what they're doing. And I'd spent the last few years in school learning about wastewater treatment and, 
you know, I'd seen the massive anaerobic digesters the city of Los Angeles uses to process its sludge. And I knew that there's a reason why half of the global population still lacks access to proper, safely managed sanitation. There's a reason why nearly a billion people still practice open defecation today, 2019. Proper sanitation requires technical knowledge, infrastructure, and energy. And all of these things cost money. Sanitation problems don't exist because we don't know how to solve them. They exist because we don't have the resources to solve them. And I thought it was that simple. So, you know, look at me. I'm 20 years old. I'm a student. I don't have a billion dollars. I can't help you. But six months later, I'm on a plane to India, and I step foot in these urban slums, and I realize how completely wrong I was. Because even if I had all the resources in the world, I wasn't going to be able to solve this problem. So for context, Delhi, it's one of the most populated cities in the world. Um, a third of its population lives in what we'd classify as a slum, and half of those people lack access to basic services like running water, electricity, sanitation, proper housing. This is what a street looks like, although you can't really call it a street because you can barely fit a motorcycle through it. And you look down and you have these open sewers with human waste untreated flowing past your front door. Um, it's unbearably hot. It's unbearably smelly. I can't even begin to explain what that smell is like. And there's a trash problem. And so you get these buildups of garbage clogging these sewers that barely function on their own until it looks something like this. And it's everywhere you look. And that's just when you look down. You look up, pure pandemonium. <laughs> I mean, I, I was so overwhelmed. I couldn't even think of how we were going to tackle this. How were we supposed to solve this problem? Everything I learned in school up to this point, nothing prepared me for it. And so I'm thinking, nope, there's no way a Western sewer is going to work here. It's just not possible. It's not going to work. Maybe community toilets, which they, tr they, they do try, they have them, except I know for a fact from people I've met firsthand that they would much rather cross the train tracks behind their home and do their business there than walk 10 minutes to the community toilet that's poorly managed, which they probably have to pay to use. So what do we do? Do we give up? Do we pack our bags and head home because we're so out of our league we just can't even think of a solution? This is when I started to realize I'm thinking too much like an engineer. I'm thinking too much of the first world I live in. And it'd be like fitting a monster truck into a mini, like a mini Cooper. It's, it's you know, the apples to oranges. And so what do we have to do? We have to design for this space. We have to design something small and compact and modular, something that fits the needs of the people living here, something that won't upend their entire way of life. So that's what we do. We come up with this waterless toilet with an attached family-sized anaerobic digester which produces biogas for energy. Now, my project in India coupled with my time in Kenya, has completely changed the way I engineer. It has taught me that if we want to change lives, we have to change how we think. We can't just expect what we know here to work somewhere completely different. We have to appreciate and recognize and know the context of the places we're engineering in and the people we're engineering for. What we're learning in school and what's in our textbooks is not going to prepare us in the slightest for the most vulnerable and the hardest to reach people. A week from today, I am actually going to be getting on an airplane and flying to Lesbos, Greece to test a new product I've been developing since August in various refugee camps. And I'm taking this class called Innovations in Design Engineering for Global Challenges, in which we're developing life-saving and life-improving products and technologies for refugees. Now, most kids in engineering school never get the opportunity to learn how to engineer for the fleeting and the passing. We learn how to engineer cities, but we don't learn how to engineer makeshift cities. And 
I feel so fortunate to have this opportunity because this, this right here, is the future of engineering. The future of engineering is engineering for the unknown and the unseen and the unheard. Being an engineer is not gonna mean just being stuck in a cubicle all day doing math. It doesn't mean applying the same cookie cutter solutions laid out in our textbooks. The world is just too complex for that at this point. You know, we can't expect these black and white solutions to work. We can't expect $30 to be readily available to spend. We can't expect what we know is practiced to work somewhere else and be working in a place that is so different from what we know. If we want to be good engineers, we have to change the game in terms of how we think. We have to be game changers. So for all of you girls out there who are still trying to find your path and trying to decide what your future holds, and you may have discounted engineering. You may be thinking, I'm no engineer. It's far too boring and nerdy, not for me. I want to challenge you in that because I think you're wrong. Because I think that if you believe yourself to be a problem solver and an innovator and an activist and someone who wants to spark change in the world, you are an engineer. Thank you.